This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien begins today's show with this week's grain market update. He says what action the markets have seen as we enter the last month of the year. Continuing the show is an episode from the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat podcast. K-State's Brad White, Philip Lancaster, and Ted Schroeder discuss what consumers are most concerned about when it comes to sustainability and meat purchases. A weather update with K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond rounds out the show. He says people can expect to dry out and warm up in the coming week. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Friday show with this week's grain market update. And as always, we're joined by K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Shelby. Dan, beforehand, you're talking about how market prices are hitting lows, especially for corn and wheat. Well, I I think on the minds of uh, Kansas farmers who harvested their crops this year, and if if they're holding their crops, they're wondering about whether we're at harvest lows. And and of course, for corn, we've traded down into the 470, 480 area, thereabouts on uh, Thursday of this week, the, the 30th yesterday, basically, uh, 461 and three quarters was the price that we traded down to. And the March contract, 486 and three quarters for corn for the close. So that what's what's happening both in the corn contracts with those prices and in and in wheat, again, with uh, wheat closing yesterday, 643 and a quarter for, for the Dease contract in March at 643, we've entered now into the delivery periods for those contracts. So it'd be a great time <laughs> to, to actually have harvest lows. And, and uh, when you look at the traders' positions, again, and there generally are commercial commercial traders, again, elevators, physical users, those that lend liquidity to the contract, that would be the more speculative traders, uh, manage money, we call them politely, and then also index traders. So you, you look at, at folks like that, and they've had short positions, uh, particularly for corn, for a fair amount of time now. And I looked at some of those numbers. They've they've built up quantity of of short positions, sell positions on them, and are at the point now where we, we've had lows here. We're going to be closing out of out of those contracts. And, and uh, with so many people having short positions, they have to buy their way back out. So that tends to take prices up higher. So you've, you've got that that type of action coming on and, and raises the question of whether this will Will lead to to a change in market direction again. Uh, do we go sideways? Do we go higher from this? Uh, are any are any run ups run ups that we see temporary? Just as and people uh, short covering as they call those positions. Uh, again, our farmer audience is very familiar with that terminology. So those are possibilities. So when I, in, in in my thinking, uh, I, I think we have that in hand. We do have a USDA report coming up a week from uh, Friday. It would be on the uh, December the Eight. So, chance for new new information to come in, and we have had low prices start to spur some buying action in the in the futures futures market. So that's seen that for corn, for wheat, uh, and uh, have have had a pretty good pretty good run also for for soybeans of late. Also, so you have some things happening uh, again. More export action for corn really than for other other commodities. And also, I w- would add in the low prices for uh, corn have been uh, may have, have allowed ethanol plants to still may operate at a profit at least as I've calculated numbers in the last for for the month of November so far. So low prices have tended to cure low prices and brought on demand both domestically and with foreign buyers seeing this disease as buying opportunities. Again, you did, we just have uh, farmers at a crucial stage that uh, will be entering December. Some some will be making decisions about selling now or holding till past the, uh, the first of the year for tax purposes. Again, uh, just a, a crucial time. So I, I think uh, what happens from today on in through that next USDA report uh, bears watching. It's crucial crucial time in the market and uh, very likely that that we could see something moving to the higher side. I would say, since we talked about wheat, wheat futures had traded down the uh, March contract. Now, pay attention to March instead of December. March had traded down to basically uh, $6 within the last week or so. It's traded back up to about 643 
see. So, you know, that's a 40 cent gain off, off of recent lows. Uh, at least get Garner's attention as to where, where the markets might be going. And, and, and that's before we start looking at, uh, at things happening overseas. Uh, Russia rattling their saber about uh, holding back on sales and all sorts of things coming in. So you have all that happening. So I, I think it's quite a time and, and it, it's an important time for uh, decision makers, for especially for that are holding any old crop grain with regard to uh, their hopes that, that we'd be seeing lows in the market and moving at least sideways to higher from here on out. If you'd like, I could talk about the cash markets also, uh, Shelby. Go for it, Dan. So the downside of what we've just been talking about is that cash corn prices Across the state, have, have uh, are at or below five dollars in almost local, all locations. You even have Southwest Kansas closing yesterday at the highest price that I could see uh, listed on the, on the market news services was four ninety eight. Again, breaking below five dollars. So that that's a big thing. Interesting that new crop prices uh, in that same area. There is, is a new crop price five twenty two. That's out into October November. So you still have that. But in, in most other places, we're down, we're see, we're seeing cash prices. In I, I guess. I call it the the uh, eastern two thirds central and and eastern Kansas more like four fifty seven four sixty three four seventy seven four fifty eight so uh, again uh, any anybody that uh, is holding old crop grain is hold, hoping for something uh, markedly higher than that to reward them for storage grain sorghum bids as we've been talking all along you still see in in key export areas a premium of of grain sorghum prices. To uh, to cash corn, uh, and you see most of those. And again, the uh, Salina strongest, Salina and Hutchinson the strongest premiums, but also some stronger gr- sorghum prices in the Topeka area. Soybean prices we have seen with some strength here of late in the Topeka area, over thirteen dollars for uh, cash soybeans. Uh, most other areas. Pretty strong. Uh, you're seeing especially uh, Salina, twelve ninety three, thirteen oh eight, Topeka, uh, thirteen eighteen in Hutchinson. Again, just like Topeka, really really strong. And the others out to the west were twelve thirty eight, twelve fifty eight thereabouts or or, or weaker. Uh, wheat prices again with this recent run up that we had, uh, particularly on on Thursdays. A bit, a bit stronger market than we had seen the last couple of days. You're seeing cash prices now in most areas. Well, in Salina, Topeka, uh, Hutchinson area is back over six dollars, uh, and uh, still five sixty three as a top in the Colby area, Garden City five eighty three, five ninety three in, in in Columbus. So we just a, a continuation of the situation with with wheat, where we with our uh, international. Uh, situation leading to a temporary over oversupply from Russia coming in and, and it's Russia and, and Ukraine and with their trade coming in and, and still being a burden on U.S. markets e- even in the face of tight international supplies. I, I would say too, you when you talk about the wheat prices for uh, for wheat out west, it's really interesting to see the off of our Ag Manager website the uh, the trends for for wheat basis levels in in uh, the western third of the state where we've we've gone below as well as much as it looks like uh, along the lines of of about uh, 50 60 cents below where our typical basis levels are are now at this time of year and it have dove sharply below that and, and just aren't showing a lot of strength but in uh, in other areas we've basically come down to historically what have been lows in the last three or four years and have stayed there and and that's pretty much the situation for corn basis levels can come down to, to where we've been in the past and are are just hanging out there now until we get further news for cash basis levels across the state and uh, still a bit of an uptrend in most areas for for grain sorghum and, and soybeans also just about like corn coming down to historic lows so it's quite the time you know it's not an exciting uptime in the market but just a, a time to that where we're just we're sort of biding our our attention on the market uh, and and waiting to see what might happen on the on the strong side to the upside. I would say you do have signals. Uh, again, we're still looking at South America with their crop risk, so that that narrative on the market hasn't changed. We're still uh, un- uncertainty. You do see reports out of uh, major market watching groups in uh, Brazil talking about tangible four million metric tons, ten million metric tons reduction in soybean production. So that's that's a big deal. Supports the soybean market, and uh, if those areas stay dry, eventually gets gets to 
starts to have an impact on corn as well. But but again, if, if that's coming, the market's not paying attention to it yet. And Dan, real quick, thinking internationally, next week, you and Guy Allen are going to be joining Antonia Boyaka for an update from Ukraine and sharing a little bit of information from your aspect. And so could you give our listeners just a quick preview of a few things you might be talking about? Yeah, and, and that will happen on Wednesday at noon. It's it's a free webinar. Uh, Antonina will talk about uh, uh, European issues, uh, particularly the Black Sea region, but really affects all of Europe for the grain markets. And Guy and I will follow up with a quick look at domestic markets, but also internationally. One thing that, we, that we've been looking at uh, that I think bears a lot of notice is the dryness in the Panama Canal and how that affects uh, shipments of uh, potential shipments of grain out the U.S. Gulf into the to Asian markets. So that has a direct Im- impact on exports there. It affects rail prices and transportation here in the U.S. So that's that's sure uh, sure an issue. And then we'll have all that much more information available in terms of what our competitors and, and colleagues to the south and Argentina and Brazil have for their current crop conditions. So I guess stay tuned for that. From 12 to 1.30 it's listed, if, but we'll be done probably sooner than that unless qu- questions take us there. And you can register for that off of our, uh, our Ag Manager website website www period ag manager period info and uh, and you can register for that again free of charge anytime and that meeting comes off at uh, it would be on the on December the 6th 12 to 130 Dan I appreciate you taking the time once again to join us and give us our grain market update Thank you very much Shelby I appreciate it That was K-State Grain Economist Dan O'Brien. That Ukraine update that we'll be joined by Dan and Guy Allen for is taking place December 6th on Wednesday from noon to 1.30. I will put a link in today's show notes on agtoday.net where you can get signed up for it for free. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we continue our Friday show with part of a podcast episode from K-State's Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat Podcast. We're now going to be joined by K-State's Brad White, Philip Lancaster, and Ted Schroeder as they discuss a research project they've worked on around sustainability. We hear a lot about sustainability, and sustainability in the beef production system. Philip, you're a part of a group that's the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. One of the questions that has frequently arisen is what is sustainability and what does it mean? And that can be addressed to either producers or consumers. One of the cool things, and and Ted, I applaud you for taking this on because we want to find out what's that connection between what consumers want and what beef producers are actually doing. So I'm going to start this conversation by Philip, maybe give us an overview of there's some categories of sustainability where sustainability for beef production. Tell us what those categories are, and then I'm going to ask Ted about what he found on some of the survey work. So typically, kind of we, we kind of categorize sustainability in what we call three pillars. So there's the economic pillar, which has to do with profitability at the ranch level, um, just economic activity in the, the community and, and things like that. There's what we call the social pillar, and that has to do with things like antibiotic stewardship, animal welfare, and just the general public's perception of an industry, not just beef production, but just any industry. And then there's the environmental pillar, which is the one we seem to hear the most about and and kind of think the most about, I think, when we hear the word sustainability, but involves like greenhouse gases, water quality, soil health, um, all those type of things. So, Ted, one of the things we had a conversation early on, and you mentioned for beef producers to implement changes and hit sustainability metrics, often there are costs associated. And finding out if those different metrics have different costs, are they meaningful to consumers? So you and and one of your students, Elias, who worked together to put together a survey, and, and we talked about that as well, what are what is some of the thought process that goes into it, and how how did that research go? Well, one of the most important things first, I think, to put in context is where does sustainability and the components that uh, that Philip mentioned around sustainability, where do those rank in terms of consumer preferences? And while they 
are important. There are some other components that the consumer absolutely demands that beef products have. Whether one labels them sustainability or not is, is up for debate, but items that we've done as we've done survey work, uh, and we've done a lot of consumer survey work, including the study that, that you're referencing, but right away what we see is, is some of the major factors consumers want first before they even will purchase and continue to purchase a product is first that it is fresh. Now, freshness has a lot of connotations to it, but freshness, price, the cost of the product, the taste, the flavor of the product, and the safety of the product, those four categories always rank as the top items that consumers just expect that product to to deliver as well as be valued at as they make purchase decisions. So so those items – are always multiple surveys. Those are what's going to come out on top. And one of your questions was, where do these sustainability, whether it's the environmental metrics Philip talked about or some of the animal welfare, where do they rank relative to those top four? Absolutely. You know, and again, not to say that safety of food or or price of food are not related to sustainability. Obviously, they are. But as you start to drill down to things like, uh, say, the uh, – the environmental aspects of of beef and beef production routinely especially things such as greenhouse gas type of of concerns consumers do not rank those highly as 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 things they're concerned about or that are most important to them as they make beef purchase versus other purchase decisions yeah and in this study you you surveyed thousands of consumers across the country and tried to target a variety of areas, and you ask all these questions and had them had them rank. So when you say the greenhouse gas didn't rank as high, was that surprising, Philip? As you as you went into this study, because we went into it thinking we hear a lot about greenhouse. We go to a beef production meeting, it's sustainability. You hear a lot about greenhouse gas. Was it surprising to you where it ranked? Yeah, I was surprised. Um, the you know the U.S. Roundtable talks a lot about greenhouse gases and methane and. Uh, a lot of the focus on beef sustainability has been around greenhouse gas emissions and methane. And so, you know, that's what we see a lot in the media um, related to beef production. And so I was, I was pretty surprised that when we got the results of this survey, that was the least important attribute by far of consumers. So which of, which of the sustainability attributes, Ted, came up as, as higher? I know none of them ranked higher than their, our price or flavor or food safety, but – which of the sustainability was toward the top? One, one that's shown up for a long time, and, and fortunately the beef industry has a good record on this, but it's animal welfare. Consumers do show uh, concern about animals being raised in ways that they view as uh, you know, appropriate and proper for the production system. So that one is there. Uh, another one that... Uh, that does show up in, in most of our work. Again, it, it's not as high ranked as the others, but concerns over things such as uh, antibiotic use in animal production as well as uh, synthetic hormone use. I think those might have be in there for different reasons by different people. And one other thing I should mention just kind of overall that, that's very interesting to us about this work in consumer survey is while we talk about these rankings and relative rankings, Consumers are quite heterogeneous. In other words, as we look across the U.S. consumer, there are niche markets even for our lowest rank, low-carbon beef product. We, we mentioned the greenhouse gas. There are some consumers that value that highly. Um, most do not, but some do. And you can go down across all of the different attributes we have examined in this study as well as others, and we find a lot of heterogeneity. And what that means is – there is opportunity for differentiated beef product offering in the U.S. A lot of different product attributes and labeling that will appeal to some, but but always keeping in mind the most important ones will will matter. So all consumers are not the same, which is why we have some of those niche products. So from this from this survey, and Philip and Ted, I'll ask you guys, you've thought the most about it. What are some of your take-homes that you would want to share with a beef producer from what you learned from this research? 
So one of the most important take-homes, again, that, that this study, I think, reveals is while there are certainly initiatives to try to be more sustainable, and, and, and that's a good thing, right? We, we want to produce beef that is uh, profitable, that's supporting local communities, that's not environmentally hazardous, or that's not you know, contributing problems there that's socially acceptable. All of those are good things. But what we've got to be very careful about is if we impose certain rules, regulations on the industry to meet certain criteria or follow certain processes, that those come with costs. You know, and, and if you add costs to the industry, you're going to immediately affect price, one of the most important factors that, that affects the the demand for the product. It, it is a major component of, of consumer purchase preferences. So it's, it's just really important that I think as we go down the industry from a policy perspective of carefully evaluating the trade-off of, say, imposing a regulation around or, a, or, or some metric of measuring greenhouse gases or something else, that, that it can't come with added costs or it will be problematic for the entire industry. It could do definitely more harm to the industry than it could help it. I think one of the things that comes across to me uh, from a per, in, like thinking of an individual producer standpoint is the animal welfare type of aspect and the high ranking that that got in the survey – and so when, the, when producers are talking to the general public and consumers about sustainability, that should probably be one of the things that they focus on and that, you know, talk to them about the, how they take care of their animals and just all the, the work and all the, the vaccine protocols and all the health protocols and all that kind of stuff that goes into making sure those animals are taken care of well. And so because I think that goes a long way with the consumer based on what we see in this survey. The observations that we do for animals, the nutrition, the whole plan. And I, and I like, Ted, I really like your point of if we add costs, we have to be cautious that we don't offset the number one or one of the top drivers, which is the price of the product that goes to consumers. So there's going to be a trade off with any of these. And that's why this work is so important. I appreciate you guys sharing that. I know there's publications and work in process where we'll be able to get more details on both those. But I appreciate you sharing on that today. Once again, that was Brad White, Philip Lancaster, and Ted Schroeder on the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat Podcast. You can find it by going to ksubci.org or searching for it on your favorite podcast streaming platform. I will also link it in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but when we come back, we'll have this week's weather updates. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Friday show with a weather update with K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. Chip, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And Chip, we weren't with you last week because of Thanksgiving. However, we did have snow around that time, which is something you predicted. Yeah, you know, every once in a while, meteorologists get it right. We, we had a good amount of snow Friday into, into Saturday and across a lot of Kansas, mostly South Central into Northeast Kansas, there were the highest amounts we saw were up to 14 inches on the Marion County area. There was a, a pretty good amount of moisture in that precipitation where we did have the higher total six inch plus salt, over a half inch of rain, at least equivalent moisture as a result. So some needed moisture and it fell very nicely. Nice light wind snow event. That's really rare in Kansas. I just pulled a couple of numbers for the Manhattan area just just looking at the, the six-inch snowfall total. And it was the, the first six-inch snowfall that area had seen since 2020. So it had been uh, over three years since we had seen that much snow. And we started it out, starting out this snow season, pretty early when you look at the six-inch snow event. We've only had a six-inch snow up to this point four times ever in recorded history in Manhattan. So an early snow event for this magnitude, especially for the folks that saw 10 inches plus. And unfortunately, it was ill-timed with the, the football game and a lot of travel after Thanksgiving. But the, the, cool, the surface was fairly warm, 
Still temperatures were warm, so it took a little while to cool off. That helped melt a lot of that snow initially on the pavement, which definitely helped improve travel conditions somewhat. So what temperatures are we seeing now? Yeah, so the temperatures were, over the last five, six days have really been dictated by that snow cover. Where we had thinner snow amounts in the west and in the southeast, we were able to warm up that ground and the air above it much quicker with the, the sunny skies. And that's kept them 10 to 20 degrees warmer during the day and overnight than the areas of snow stayed much cooler, barely getting above freezing in the afternoons. And then we had our first zero-degree readings of the season in Kansas, where that snowpack was from Wichita to Manhattan and the foothills there. We had lots of zero-degree readings where temperatures fell substantially due to that cold air. Can people be expecting to see some more precipitation coming up? So we we had some light precipitation in the southeast and then in part the central and and northeast Kansas saw a little bit of mixed precipitation early Friday morning. That's going to kind of continue. We're going to see that gradually taper off into Saturday morning. We'll have things clear out. That'll be our last chance precipitation for a few days potentially even a few weeks. With, with temperatures on the on the climb, we're going to be above normal. Our average highs are in the mid-40s. Our average lows are in the mid-20s. So we're going to be running about 5 to even 10 degrees above normal for most of next week uh, across the state. And that's going to melt off any snow that we have remaining and definitely be a nice, tra- nice break after the, the cooler weather over the last week. But we could use some more moisture. We really need that moisture component. That's doesn't look very likely after this system uh, this weekend. And Chip, are we seeing any moisture in a farther outlook? Yeah, there's a lot of interest in the long-term forecast right now. It looks uh, through mid-December, dry conditions and warmer. We'll have a couple cold fronts come through middle of the month. And then we look at a pattern change. And this pattern change has signs of cold Arctic air in the north. The polar vortex looks like it's going to weaken with the stratospheric warming event. And that's going to result in dips of the Arctic air southward into the, the mid-latitudes where we live and might open the potential for some pretty cold and active weather uh, mid to late December. So it would be something to keep an eye on with Christmas time, and we might go two for two with, with cold and snow for the holidays. Chip, I appreciate you taking the time to join today and give us our weather update. Yep, thanks for having me. That was Kansas State University meteorologist Chip Redmond. You can keep up to date with the weather at mesonet.ksu.edu. That is M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. There are also resources available on the Mesonet related to animal and crop production. I will link the Mesonet in today's show notes on actday.net. That's all we have for you this week on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you on Monday.